So welcome, my name is Mariana Grossman, and I'm the founder and managing partner of Minerva Ventures, and we are an advisory firm that works on climate adaptation strategy and solutions. And we look at what are the risks and costs of climate change and climate adaptation, and we think that unaccounted for risk is not good business. So if you wanna have a well-managed business or a well-managed community or, or a governmental agency, you have to take into account the things that Robert Weissenmiller was talking about. I hadn't heard the statistic of subsidence at 21 inches a month. That's what he said, right? That's just phenomenal. That's uh, a huge impact on roads, on power infrastructure, on buildings, on rail, and um, just imagine the costs associated with dealing with those things and also the water storage, it gets lost when you have subsidence and the, the infrastructure that holds the water in the aquifers is smushed and it doesn't recharge easily. So uh, it has um, many implications and that's just one example of climate impact. So heat, fire, storms and other, other th sea level rise are beginning to be felt and will continue to accelerate. So there's this disconnect between how we operate every day and what the future is going to hold. And what the future is going to hold is really scary, and most environmentalists have decided that we can't scare people too much or they'll get depressed and give up and just party until Armageddon. So they try to maintain the sense of hope, but then you lose the urgency. So one of the things I think is really interesting, there was an article in the New Yorker in about 2013 about the rate of diffusion of anesthesia versus hygiene and hand washing in medicine. And so the germ theory was discovered and anesthesia was discovered. And anesthesia was adopted almost instantly around the world. Why? Well, imagine you're doing surgery on a patient in the Civil War with no anesthesia. The patient is thrashing, they're yelling, they're in pain. So you have to operate very fast and just try to get it over with. It's, it's extremely physically difficult and emotionally difficult and you have to have people restraining the person. It's just a, a nightmare. Imagine when you have anesthesia, you have a calm, sedated patient, you can take your time, you can be precise, you can use all kinds of delicate instruments, have better outcomes for the patient, and a much less stressful experience for the physician and, and the physician's team. So anesthesia was adopted almost instantly around the world, way before the internet. Hand washing and hygiene are a pain in the neck for the medical team. You have to scrub, you have to put on clothes and masks, you have to change your clothes in between every surgery, you have to keep everything clean and all the instruments. It's a lot of work. And the benefits accrue to the patients in the future. They accrue to the herd, to all of us collectively, but they, the hassle accrues to the physician and the medical team, and the benefits accrue to everybody else. And there, there's no feedback. You know, you don't know if somebody's had uh, sepsis or some other problem if you're operating and you're on the next patient. So that, the hygiene practices still aren't universally adopted around the world. They're, you know, and they take a lot of work, a lot of training, a lot of reinforcement to get people to follow those practices. And so climate change is kind of similar to this where taking action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to plan for adaptation is like hygiene, it's a big hassle, it's a lot of work, it's very inconvenient, and it's hard to get people to think into the future and to see the impacts. And what, if I make one little change, what difference does that make? I turn off the lights, I switch to an electric car, I put on renewables or something like that on my business, what difference does that really make in the big scheme of things? So you've gotta get, just like hand washing, everybody has to do it, nobody really wants the hassle. So we're gonna, we have a panel that have two people who were at the Paris Accords and two people who were not, but the um, people who are in their chain of hierarchy were. So one of the questions I'm really interested in is, if you have a direct experience of about 200 nations and many, many non-national entities coming together and making really significant commitment for humanity to address climate change and to take on the hygiene of, of changing our energy systems and our practices and our adaptation um, strategies. If you've got that going on, um, there's a, an impact, emotional impact of being part of that. So what is it for the people who weren't part of that, what's their experience, what motivates them, and how do you diffuse that, mo that motivation and energy 
through their, their experience, and then how can we help diffuse that excitement to you, the audience, and how can you take that forward in the companies that you run, in the institutions that you're part of, in the communities um, where you belong? How can you help your legislatures to really get on board to take bold action and not to drag their feet or uh, impede action to protect humanity and to protect our markets and to protect uh, civil society from the impacts of, of climate change? So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time introducing the panelists. I will tell you their names and their, and their roles, and there's more information on them in the program. Um, I want to preserve most of the time for them to speak. So we are really fortunate to have an amazing, diverse panel. Jan Berman is a Senior Director for Energy Efficiency Strategy for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Pat Burt is the mayor of Palo Alto, and he's also an entrepreneur and very passionate about uh, sustainability and clean tech. Mike Gatto is an assembly member from um, Burbank from the 43rd district, and he has carried legislation on biodiesel and um, other, other clean fuels, and uh, also leads, the, uh, chairs the utilities committee and the assembly. And, uh, Debbie Raphael is the head, the director of the San Francisco Department of the Environment. And both Pat and Debbie were in Paris and um, have that experience to, to share. And also, I know that Debbie was participating in the CEM7, which I think stands for the Congress of Energy Ministerial, Clean Energy Ministerial seventh meeting that was just in San Francisco and there were, there were energy leaders from around the world there, elected um, officials and people from business and, and other domains. So we have a great experienced panel and I'm going to turn it over to them. We're gonna start with Mayor Burt. Well, thanks, Mariana. Um, so in order to, uh, address Mariana's question about how Paris has uh, impacted us going forward, I, I wanted to take a, a step backward uh, because the context over the last 20 years or so very much uh, has had an impact on, on where we are. So this is not a travelogue, although the COP conferences have tended to be in some, uh, some inspirational cities. But Basically, if we look back in time to uh, the Kyoto Accord in 97, which was a very major achievement with a, a primary exception, which was that the United States uh, was never able to sign on to it. And I would put the opposition within the US to one, uh, a political organization that unlike almost all the other nations involved, uh, we basically have a uh, division of power, and Congress uh, didn't support the administration on it. And the, the refrain, I, I would say, is primarily that we, we saw at that time, or a good body of the United States and Congress saw, uh, uh, what was been proven to be a false notion, that you can't have clean energy and uh, cheap energy and a strong economy all at, at once. And so one of the things that local government has done, uh, and Palo Alto in particular, is to be able to disprove that premise. And out of, in between Kyoto and, and Copenhagen, we really had the dawn of, of the clean tech and, and clean energy um, revolution that has occurred. And much of the, the ability to, to now today have cheap clean energy has really been the result of that, that great transformation. But we thought in, in, in Copenhagen that we would have the next opportunity for a great breakthrough, and frankly, it didn't happen. So by the time COP16 occurred, uh, there was really a great deal of despair, frankly, in the air. And the only notion was that, that we, we didn't know if it would be five or 10 years before we'd have another opportunity for an international agreement. And uh, what, what could we do in the meantime? Uh, and that was for local and subnational governments and the private sector to try and move the dial and to provide successful models and really to be bottoms up political drivers. So out of that, uh, we had the Paris Accords and Ban Ki-moon uh, made a particular point that the 
the progress made by local and subnational governments in the private sector had been a major impetus in being able to come up with the uh, bilateral and ulti ultimately the, the multinational agreement that we had in Paris. And so that the, the impacts uh, from the bottom up have occurred and had a great uh, uh, influence. But now what occurred in Paris is influencing us. So if we look back, the city of Palo Alto, uh, this didn't all happen overnight of Palo Alto now coming to um, uh, 100 percent carbon free electricity and uh, now having being halfway to our goal of of an 80 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. This, the, we're, we're the beneficiaries of owning our, all our own utilities, actually the only city in the state that owns the entire um, uh, set of utilities, but we started our electricity utility in 1900 and we've been uh, really benefited from uh, the wisdom of our, our um, forefathers ever since. But really starting uh, a little over 15 years ago, we, we moved in, in a whole set of new directions. We established uh, one of the first renewable portfolio standards and, and had uh, a more aggressive one than the state. And then uh, as the state moved along, we, we saw that we could progress even further. We were uh, adopted an early sustainability plan, zero waste plan, of which we're now to nearly 80% diversion. Um, and then a comprehensive energy efficiency plan uh, which really has been a lot of the foundation for what we've been able to do. But it's not just electrical energy efficiency, it's gas efficiency. And this is a 10-year program that we've each year ratcheted down uh, our consumption. And then even uh, a water efficiency, and, and I'll, I'll mention in a moment that nexus. And then in uh, 2013, we saw that under the budget that we had set up, which is, uh, was always a, a uh, minimizing the impact on ratepayers of our renewable portfolio and a much more opportunistic um, buying structure of power purchase agreements than investor-owned utilities have been able to do, uh, we saw that under our existing budget we could actually go the rest of the way toward carbon-free electricity. We're about 45% hydro and now 55% renewables. And our cost of electricity is 30% below investor-owned utilities. 100% carbon-free, 30% below the market in cost. So that's a very strong refutation of this notion of you can't have it clean and, and cheap in a strong economy. And now we're, we're working on our next generation of our sustainability and climate action plan. And after the Paris Accord, we, we really saw that our community was invigorated by that accord. And in January, we had a summit of over 300 people on a full day on a Sunday uh, to dive, a deep dive into our sustainability and climate action plan. Our city council, just a little over a month ago, formally adopted the goal of the 80% reduction off a 1990 baseline by 2030. But that's not just an aspirational goal. We, we see that those, these goals are thrown around, and I don't really think a lot of them as goals because they don't have plans associated with them. They're more aspirations. Uh, but we're now, based upon having achieved carbon neutrality, as of over a year ago, we were 35% reduction off of 1990, and we're now getting close to the 40%. So we're halfway there. And, but we, the, what remains now that we're carbon-free electricity is not an easy path. And when we've looked for other cities and other states to see, all right, what path have you really established? What are the programs and plans to get to an 80% reduction and ultimately to a carbon-free city? And those plans don't exist, really. There are components of the plans, but not really comprehensive ones. So we're working on that now, and we integrate it between our comprehensive, um, uh, or essentially our general plan for the city that we're rewriting at the same time, and the intersection between sustainability and climate action and our general plan is for the first time be becoming fully knit together. So these, these lines show how we will basically at a high level, the categories that we have to hit to get to that um, 80% reduction. And we now have no footprint from electricity, 
So transportation and use of natural gas are now 90% of our remaining greenhouse gas reductions. So there lies the challenge. Can we really do that? How do you retire an existing um, uh, uh, infrastructure of a natural gas infrastructure? We don't know of any program that has ever taken an infrastructure like that and retired it. And we're struggling with that. But we're, we've, we've determined to not try and score a touchdown from the 20 yard line. We'll get across the 50, uh, continue to reduce our, our uh, uh, use of natural gas through efficiency and through electrification of switching over to electricity, perhaps to um, having a renewable gas portfolio on the remainder, and then five years from now, try to come up with the balance of the plan. But then the remainder is what we do with 60% of our remaining greenhouse gas emissions that are from, um, from mobility, our transportation system principally um, uh, gas in our, in our vehicles. So can we really get to that point? And we're actually, this is an intersection between this general plan and sustainability and quality of life. So we know, we don't think that we have a competition between climate protection and climate adaptation and sustainability and the things that local residents care most about in their personal quality of life. Congestion and parking and air pollution are all quality of life issues and not just climate change issues. So we're intersecting those and, and bringing together a lot greater political support because we're framing the issues around things that people care about. We have a lot of people who say, yeah, I care about climate change, but boy, I really care about that traffic problem. And I really care about not being able to park in my neighborhood, but I do care about climate change or someone else who really cares about emergency preparedness and resiliency. And, uh, and we're trying to pull them in to the conversation on all those directions. So we also are a test bed. We're all here in the center of innovation. Uh, this is the famous HP Garage. This is a 20, 20th century model that really was the foundation of Silicon Valley and Palo Alto as a center of innovation. But the 21st century version of that looks a little bit different. Um, and, um, and we're seeing, interestingly, Palo Alto's a car town, who'd have thunk? Uh, we not only have Tesla here as a headquarters, uh, we have the Electric Power Research Institute and Xerox Park that have been great centers, but now virtually every one of the major automotive companies has their center of innovation and research in either Palo Alto or surrounding areas. And all of the next duration, generation of clean vehicles share, that are shared and autonomous, powered by uh, clean energy uh, as a vision for automobile futures in combination with all of the other mobility efforts that we can take. Uh, when I, I rode my bike here, as I do now, because I, I tell people, not because I'm trying to uh, uh, be so ethical, but because I didn't have time to drive and park. Um, and I can get door to door faster by bike in most things in our community than if I drove. But we have cities like Copenhagen that are world leaders in, in, um, in mode share of bicycling, over 50%. But in fact, uh, in our school system, we began over 20 years ago a comprehensive program of safe routes to school. We went from under 15% of our students, high school students riding to today over 45%. And uh, so in that model, we've shown that in the United States, we can do things like European communities have done. And it's a lifestyle, it's a health issue. Once again, it's a quality of life and, and public safety issue as well. But then we get this great uh, nexus between uh, what we're doing in energy and uh, what is a, a, a great concern for our state. Uh, and one that frankly strikes people emotionally, uh, which is, um, our drought. But for us, we have 45% of our power comes from hydro. So it's not just whether we have water, it's whether we have power. And a sustainable water supply is something that we are seeing as, as, as important as any of our other initiatives. We think that we're, we're moving toward a future of recycled potable water for a major portion of our, of our water supply. This is what's actually already in San Jose. Uh, that's online of advanced recycling. But finally, uh, water 
is both a, a resource issue on, on in itself, it is uh, uh, a big part of our power consumption in California and our power resource, uh, but ultimately it is a great deal of what we're looking at as climate adaptation. We just last Monday uh, moved forward with uh, prioritizing uh, sea level rise and beginning a plan for sea level rise in our community as we have throughout this bay where the bulk of the most important companies in Silicon Valley are threatened by sea level rise. And, but, but, the, but the impact of that climate change on water hits the other end of the extreme. Um, and when I was at, um, at COP16, I was standing in line and, and uh, uh, talking with some African representatives uh, and I told them that I had uh, stopped in an airport in Florida and some really nice women had asked me where I was going and I, I told them and they, as politely as they could, said, so you believe in that climate change stuff? And they were really nice, polite women and they just, <laughs> they didn't want to offend me uh, with their skepticism. And the African representatives, when I told them that story, they said, we are today massively impacted by climate change. It's not the future. It's the present. So ultimately, what can we all do uh, as local governments that can have um, a leveraged and, and rippled impact? And I think that, that Paris has inspired us to do more. And by doing more, we can have that impact on others. So thanks. So our, our sister city to the north, San Francisco, Debbie Raphael. And there's nothing I need to do, it just appears. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to get out and do, sorry. Great, thank you. Debbie Raffel, Department of Environment, San Francisco, and I can tell you that having a neighbor and a partner like Palo Alto is both inspiring and intimidating. There is a lot of wonderful, friendly competition between the city of LA and all of the cities surrounding LA, Palo Alto, San Francisco. We're always pushing each other to do better and learn from each other. So what I wanna do today is just talk briefly about my personal experience in Paris, that's what I was asked to talk about, and then bring that back to what's going on in San Francisco and what the lessons of Paris really are. So as everyone here knows, Paris uh, was incredible success, COP21, 195 nations came together and made verifiable commitments. They promised that in two years, in five years, they would come back and they would tell the world how they did, how they did towards meeting their goals. My experience of Paris was a little different. Uh, I was uh, walking around looking for uh, action, and as many of you know, because of all the, uh, the terrorist attacks, Paris itself, outside of these climate talks, was pretty sleepy. This was as close to a demonstration as I got, a group of people uh, walking across a bridge with some signs. Uh, the climate talks were um, organized in two areas. There was the blue zone, which is where all those negotiations were happening, and this is about as close as I got to inside the blue zone. You needed to have credentials, this is where all the diplomats were, um, and it was very impressive, but for me, representing a city, uh, it was a little bit foreign from my experience. Where I spent my time was in this place called the green zone. The green zone is where civil society gathered. This is where people from around the world, from NGOs and cities and businesses came to talk about their personal commitment to, to making what was happening in the blue zone real. I like to say the blue zone is about that policy and that high level goals. The green zone is where the action happened. And it was a phenomenal place to be for that period of time. And I want to share with you one of the people I met in the green zone because his story for me epitomizes what we need and the lessons of Paris. His name is Stefan Martinez. Stefan, uh, so me being from San Francisco and all about zero waste, of course, when I'm in the green zone, 
I don't care just about what's in the front of the house. I want to know the back of the house. So how close to zero waste is the uh, COP agreement? So I got the behind-the-scenes tour of all the sorting. It was very cool. And I met this guy, Stefan Martinez. So Stefan is a restaurateur. And as you can imagine in Paris, people are very attached to their food and to the restaurants. And Stefan had a problem. He had leftover food and he had nowhere to put it because the city of Paris, while it had recycling, had no food waste composting. So what he did is he took it into his own hands. He said, I know there's something we can do with this food. So he took the food and he started to invest in anaerobic digestion. And now, three years later, he services 80 restaurants in Paris. He has a whole system of clear plastic bags that he delivers to the wait staff and the cook staff so that they can do their separation and get that instant feedback, what's going the right place. He bought an anaerobic digester and a centrifuge that separates out the plastic. He takes the biogas that comes out of that food waste from those 80 restaurants. He, he uses that to uh, fuel his trucks. And he takes the compost to spread out on agricultural land in, outside of Paris to sequester carbon. So what Stefan's message to me was, we, don't, we can't afford to wait for those guys in the blue zone to figure things out. We need to take action in our own hands, and we need to do whatever is possible within each of our abilities to accelerate actions on climate change. So we've got a challenge, and our challenge is, is that Stefan is not the norm. All of us come from communities where most people are actually not that interested in figuring out what they can do. And Mariana's example of washing hands is a great example, it's a great metaphor for this. So how are we gonna engage everyone? Because it's gonna take us all. Well, what I noticed in Paris was this is the language of climate change. The language of policymakers is incredibly wonky and dense. It's things like, we've gotta reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. Or it's this wonderful new agreement, this under two MOU. We've gotta reduce our emissions so that we limit uh, warming to below two degrees Celsius. Well, I have to say that that does nothing for most people. When I go to our, the mayor of San Francisco and I say, yes, this is what we need to do, he looks at me and says, okay, I'll sign it, but what does that even mean? So the question and the, the solution is we need a better frame. We need a better way to talk about climate change so that we can accelerate what needs to happen and we can engage all the, the latent Stefans that are out there. We need a way to engage everyone, whether it's a business, a church, a, um, a government official. We need to give them the language. And so in San Francisco, we've developed a different way of talking about climate change. And it's very simple and it's very elegant. Zero, 50, 100 roots. Zero, 50, 100 roots. This is San Francisco's climate action strategy. Zero is zero waste. Zero waste to landfill and incineration. It's getting at those, at methane, at, at those very potent greenhouse gases. And of course, it's more efficient upstream as well when you look at the whole life cycle of consumption. 50, 50% 50 transit, 50% of trips in sustainable modes, and when you're in a, and that means no single occupancy vehicles. And when you're in one, of course, it's a renewable fuel. And 100, 100% renewable energy, and as, um, the mayor of Palo Alto explained, that's not just electricity, we have paths for electricity, but it's looking at natural gas as well, and it's looking at vehicle fuels. And finally, roots. Roots is the thing I like to say, 0, 50, 100 is how we do less bad in the world, and roots is how we're gonna heal the planet. Because what we know from the Marin Carbon Project and the work at UC Berkeley is that if you put compost out on rangeland, you massively increase the ability of that soil to absorb carbon. And those of us who listened uh, to the presentation this morning and you saw California's climate action strategy, you might have noticed that on the far right of that report, one of the icons was the Healthy Soils Initiative. The idea that we've got to use our soils as a carbon sink because the ocean is saturated. We in San Francisco cannot plant enough trees to do much big of a dent there, but we can pull CO2 out of the air if we use our food compost to the best ability and improve the soil fertility. So 0, 50, 100 roots is the way we are engaging San Franciscans, the way we are taking the lessons of the need for action from Paris. 
So the question is, is it working? Well, if you take a look at San Francisco, we have been in a boom. That's not a surprise to anybody in the room. Since 1990, our population has increased almost 15% and our GDP by almost 50%. At that same period of time, we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 23.3%. So again, just like Palo Alto's story, there is a decoupling between economy and greenhouse gases. We've seen this actually three times today. So in this room, we understand that that's a truth and that's something we need to share with the rest of the world. So Kofi Annan said that the world has the, techno the technological know-how to solve its problems, but do we have the political will? That's the question. It's not one of know-how. We know the solutions. We know what we need to do. But do we have the political will? And my message from Paris was that Paris was about a call to action. It was a challenge through people like Stefan Martinez, through the people I met in the green zone, to the people who were protesting to the best of their ability on the streets of Paris. It's a call to action to all of us, that it's up to us because the policymakers, they're just a start. And we're not going to accelerate things. We're not going to get to those goals unless every one of us is doing our part. So thank you. I'd like to welcome Jan Berman from Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, thanks, Mariana. It is uh, fabulous to be back at Stanford, so I want to give the Precourt Institute a thanks for letting me come back and relive my student days just briefly today. Uh, I personally found those talks from Pat and Debbie so inspirational, hearing about their experiences in Paris and then where that took them in terms of action. And I want to start with Paris as well because I had a similar experience when our executives came back from Paris. So let's start there. We had uh, four executives in Paris, including our CEO, Tony Early. And uh, I think we were the only investor-owned utility that uh, went from California, although many others uh, went from California as well. And over the two weeks, our leaders participated in quite a few panels talking about SB 350, AB 32, and California's experience on the path to a cleaner energy supply. And uh, the message that I really took back uh, when they came back and held brown bags and meetings to share the experience was we in California are sometimes so focused on the path ahead and what we need to still accomplish that it can be a little bit stressful. Uh, but, but when we were in Paris, everyone wanted to know how we've come as far as we've already come. And we realized, gosh, we have a lot of things we can contribute in how to run a utility system with a very high percentage of renewables, solar, wind, and hydroelectric. How do we balance that? Uh, other countries were very interested in it. How have we integrated higher percentages of distributed renewables? And how are we moving forward with electric vehicles? Uh, so it made us feel that uh, not only do we have many steps to take, getting a cleaner California, uh, but we have a lot to contribute to the world getting there as well. Uh, so I focused, I focused on that and then thought, all right, what do we do looking forward? Uh, now, I have spent quite a bit of time working on energy efficiency, and I appreciate that both uh, Professor Sweeney and Professor Weisenmiller uh, spent a lot of time on energy efficiency this morning. I think they may have both mentioned the Rosenfeld curve, which is the curve I'm showing here. It's named after UC Berkeley Professor Art Rosenfeld. And it shows that divergent path California took in the 1970s, uh, while the rest of the nation continued along doubling their per capita consumption of elect, uh, electricity, uh, California went on the flat path starting in the 1970s and has not increased its per capita consumption of electricity since then. Uh, there are a lot of takeaways you can get from what this has meant to California. Uh, first of all, we estimate that we have not built about 30 conventional power plants because of this path. Uh, that certainly is a huge contributor to not generating more pollutants over the last 30 years. 
Uh, in addition, uh, we estimate that it's avoided the release of about 30 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, which is the equivalent of about 6 million cars, so good step forward. Uh, and we've saved California's residences and businesses about $12 billion by taking this path, which is money that can be reinvested in the economy. Now, one of my favorite statistics that I'll give at risk of offending any Texans who might be in the room, if California spent the same share of their economy on the electricity bill as Texas does, we would spend an, ad an additional $30 billion a year on electricity. So we've got $30 billion we can pump back into the GDP to continue to create better economic growth and a cleaner environment uh, simultaneously that may be missing from other states, and we're looking forward to helping them get on this same path. We also have a lot of experience with renewable energy, and I think another speaker already referred to the high percentage of carbon-free energy in our mix. It's largely renewables, large hydro uh, and nuclear, some market purchases, and then some natural gas. Uh, one of the things not shown on this slide is that the pie would be about 20% bigger if we hadn't changed paths in energy efficiency. So that's a really significant amount of uh, resources that we would have had to construct of some type that we didn't. Uh, we've also focused a lot on uh, the connection of distributed renewables, which is something that's been very popular in California. Uh, in fact, we have one of the fastest interconnection times for distributed renewables solar power in the state. Uh, we connect about one every seven minutes. Now, when I first started working on distributed solar in the year 2000, we had 163 rooftop solar units. We're at 240,000 now, although at the rate of one every seven minutes, that statistic is probably wildly off already. Uh, so we have learned a lot about operating a system that has these intermittent uh, solar units coming on and off the grid. When I said this statistic in a room full of utility personnel that we typically can connect a distributed solar system in about two days, uh, there was complete silence in the room. And someone finally shouted out, more power to you, pg &E. how did you do it? <laughs> it's just not something other utilities have yet got to scale on, but I think that they all will be throughout the United States. Uh, we also have offered our employees a discount on solar power, so that's helping employees go solar too if they'd like to. Uh, another area of focus for the state is transportation, and a number of speakers have talked about that. Uh, we are trying to do our part to contribute to the growth of electric vehicles in California, uh, partially by filing an application to install some public charging infrastructure, which we hope will help get over the range anxiety and spur the growth of electric vehicles. We've also got a large electric vehicle fleet ourselves, about 1,400 electric vehicles, so we're pretty experienced working with an electric fleet. Uh, and we offer attractive time of use rates to make electric vehicles a more attractive option. Uh, I also did want to mention that we've been doing a lot of work with our gas system to reduce methane leakage, and that actually is a fairly significant contributor. Uh, so anything we can do to stop the leaks, as we've done in the past decade or so, is an important action for climate change. So let's talk about the grid a tiny bit. Uh, the grid is a critical element of making the system work. Uh, it's become a lot more complicated to operate, and one of the things we're focusing on is how can we continue to invest in a smarter, more reliable grid uh, that will help be at the root of uh, the change that California wants to see for clean energy. So let me talk a little bit about <clears throat> going forward what we want to focus on. I mean, we've accomplished a lot already, but there is, as everyone in this room knows, a lot more to do. And I wanted to talk briefly about three areas, uh, policy, people, and partnerships. I think policy has been a key focus of people in this room and a key reason California diverged onto a more efficient, cleaner path 30 years ago. Uh, from my experience in energy efficiency, I think a lot about the codes and standards that Bob Weisenmiller mentioned. Uh, we just made it easier to be more efficient in California because you have to build buildings more efficiently and <clears throat> the equipment sold in the state has to meet certain standards. As we adopt more aggressive standards, they've been adopted federally and that was great to hear that we're learning from China now as well and working that into our codes and standards. Uh, this is the least expensive way of getting people on board with using more efficient equipment. 
I also like to reference back to what Mariana said about how do you get people to engage in the change to be more efficient. And uh, first, let me tell a little story from when I first started in energy efficiency. I was told that there was a challenge when people's water heaters break. They, you know, you call the water heater repairman, and usually there's not an efficient water heater available, so they just bring whatever's available because most people don't like to do without water heaters for the two weeks it would take to get an efficient one. So our campaign at the time was to educate people to pre-order water heaters in case theirs broke. Now, how well do you think that worked? That was... <laughs> Right? It's not, it's sort of like the hand washing example. Like it might be good for you to do, but you're pretty unlikely to get interested in pre ordering a water heater. Um, so, the reason I put this up is we started thinking about making sure that we were picking the proper point of intervention in the market to make efficiency happen wherever customers are making decisions. In this case, we needed to work with wholesalers and distributors to make sure that efficient water heaters were available to contractors in the state. And then we needed to work with contractors to provide an incentive incentive to them to pull the efficient water heaters and have them on the truck. The end use customer still just needs to make a call, but the efficient water heater could be more available now. So that's an example of what I mean by engaging at the best point of intervention. Uh, we try to do this wherever the customer is. If they're at home opening their mail, they'll get a message from us about energy efficient behaviors. If they're online, uh, we have a marketplace that helps them compare efficiency of different equipment when they're ordering. Uh, in stores, we have partnerships with retailers to display the more e efficient equipment more prominently and highlight the available rebates. Uh, and as I mentioned, we work in the trade pro environment as well. Now, that's just a residential example. The same is true for commercial. We have to look at the point where we can have the most impact to create a more efficient society. I'm just going to close with a word on how important partnerships are. We're so lucky to be here in Silicon Valley where we have opportunities to work with uh, all these br brilliant businesses that are making new advances and this is just a small set of our partnerships. I also noted the uh, important partnerships we have with all of our governments. We work on energy efficiency with them. And as well, we just announced that we're uh, providing, I'm looking up the figure, a million dollar grant program to help local governments deal with the effects of climate change. We recognize that that's something that could have a big impact on us with sea level rise, drought, and wildfires, and our governments as well. And so we're looking forward to working with our local governments on that. Uh, we also know that it's very important to uh, make sure that low-income uh, areas are represented, and so we've just signed on to a White House initiative to expand energy efficiency and renewable energy resources that are available to low-income communities. And those are just two new efforts. I think um, the reality is none of us is going to tackle climate change alone, but these partnerships and working together are really critical to how we're going to create that change you referenced and really get the momentum to address climate change. Uh, while Paris was a great start, we do have a lot to do on the path forward, and we're looking forward to being engaged in that. Thank you. I'm happy to introduce Assemblymember Mike Gatto from Burbank. We're really lucky to have him here today. And yes. So great for the lawmaker, they put up the corporate sponsorships. <laughs> so I'm Mike Gatto. I am going to uh, start my talk today with a little bit of a parable. So I, um, you know, if you've read my bio or maybe you haven't, but uh, I am happily married. I have two children, wonderful wife. I'm very happy. But um, this is actually my second marriage. And when I got married the first time, um, I was uh, dating a terrific woman, and she's somebody that I'm still very, very close friends with to this day, and she was very kind and very wonderful, but I think our personalities were like oil and water. But when I announced my engagement to most of my friends, uh, my friends uh, you know, came up to me and said, this is terrific, she's beautiful, she's great, this is wonderful, you guys are going to be very happy. But I had one friend who came to me and said, um, you know, I don't think your marriage is going to work out. And I was so angry with him. Um, you imagine being told that when you, right, when you get engaged. And he sat down with me and he said, Mike, I, I want to tell you why I don't think your marriage is going to work out. And he outlined all these things. And I don't think we spoke for the next six or seven months. I mean, it was just a very, very awkward conversation. But 15 months later, uh, as I realized that our personalities uh, were like oil and water, um, you know, and we, we got divorced, I, I had this thought that came over me, which was, 
which of my friends were the true friend? Were they the ones who told me what I wanted to hear? Or was it the one guy who had the courage to tell me what I didn't want to hear? And I would submit it was the one guy who told me what I did not want to hear. Now, that being said, I hated him when he told it to me. And, um, but I came to appreciate it much later, that type of straight talk. And I'm going to tell you some things today, and I'm going to assume that at certain points in my presentation, you're going to hate me too. Because um, I'm going to try to tell you things uh, you know, as much like they, they are, as I know. But I do hope that you know, maybe a few months later, maybe a couple years later, you will appreciate what I'm telling you here today as well. So I assume that most people are here because you want to get something done, right? And I'm a legislator, and the way that you're going to get a lot of things done in this state, obviously, is going, part of it will be going through things like the Energy Commission, Mr. Weiss and Miller, who spoke earlier today, and part of it will happen at the municipal level, but a lot of it will happen at the legislative level. And I want to talk about um, the best way to frame things to sort of get things done. There has been an absolute sea change in the legislature in my time in office. Um, and it's really due to a number of things. And, and we all know that these sea changes do occur, right, in politics from time to time. Uh, if you look at the lifetime of somebody who might have been born in 1915, when that person was a child, the Republican Party was the party of minorities and environmentalists, right? Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, that was the Republican Party. And as that person went through their 20s and 30s, the Republican Party became the party of highly educated, uh, coastal East Coast cities and uh, the people who occupied them. And it was the party of ultra small government elites, right? And now the Republican Party is this coalition of sort of, and I don't mean to impugn any Republicans, but, but I think social scientists and political scientists would say that the, the modern Republican Party is a coalition of sort of big government social conservatives who want the government to intervene, um, you know, to, to have certain social mores. And then also, by and large, a lot of undereducated people in the Deep South and things like that. And that has a sea change, folks, and it has profound repercussions to national politics. But we have had a similar sea change in the state legislature, and I want to walk you through it because I think it affects how we can get things done. So a few years ago, you know, we had six-year term limits in the assembly, and I am the last, by the way, the last person of that six-year uh, class. I get seven years in the assembly. I'm currently the longest-serving uh, assembly member. Uh, but everybody who got elected after me gets 12 years now in the assembly. And before, you had people there for a very short time who wanted to punt all the difficult decisions to the executive branch. They wanted to empower an executive branch commission with the power to do something, and they wanted them to make a tough decision. And so you saw a lot of legislation being passed where the legislature didn't really make a decision. They gave it to an executive branch agency. The executive branch agency ran with it. And you have the policies that we have in place now. Last year, we had a very, very spectacular fight over SB 350, and people wondered, why is this not getting through the legislature? Why is this not getting through the legislature? Why is there so much pushback this time? Well, it's because the legislature has changed. That is no longer acceptable to my colleagues in the legislature. They do not want, well, I mean, let's, let's put it from their perspective. So let me get this straight. I'm going to give my power away to an executive branch agency that nobody has heard of. They're going to make a decision that could be very, very unpopular, like tacking 10 cents on every gallon of gas. And then I'm going to go talk to voters to rooms like this. They're going to yell at me, and I'm going to be powerless to do anything about it? Sounds great. Sign me up. No, that was not their reaction. Their reaction was, hell no. And so you saw last year, for the first time, in anybody's memory, a democratic legislature rejecting a lot of very, very admirable climate change goals. And I know Mr. Weissenmiller talked about that, and he still seemed a little perplexed about that at the, at the end of his presentation, which I caught. But I can tell you that people who are elected for longer periods of time, people have become aware of this, uh, people have become, in the legislature, very hesitant to grow the executive branch at the expense of legislative power, and then also to have nothing to do with those policies. So the way that I hope that can inform certain of your decisions is if you want to get something through the legislature, involve the legislature. Don't give it all to the executive branch. Make sure that the legislature can actually make a decision and that you form some consensus on it within the legislature. The second thing that, that I think um, you know, I should talk about a little bit are some of the divisions within the legislature right now. And I call this the Paris Principle. You know, I was asked to talk about my experiences in Paris, and I did not go to Paris. I did not go to Paris, France, but I went to Paris, California. Has anyone ever been there? 
Okay, two people, all right. Paris, California is a town within what we call the Inland Empire. It's a part of Southern California where uh, the, many of the wonderful changes in California have bypassed this town. They have a lot of problems and, and challenges in Paris. It's still a very nice place to live, in my humble opinion. But the people of Paris, California, could not be farther away from the principles and the, uh, the rhetoric that was discussed in Paris, France. And you have a lot of legislators who represent parts of that, uh, parts of the state like that, who feel very, very disengaged. They feel like all of the high principles that are discussed in Paris, France, do not apply in places like Paris, California. And I know some of you probably shaking your head saying, oh no, these are the communities that are more affected by our energy policies. And you're right. But the reality is the people who occupy those neighborhoods, they don't necessarily, and the people who talk and elect their representatives, they don't necessarily respond to the same rhetoric that we talk about. And that's why I was so heartened by, by what Ms. Raphael said, because she was dead on. That is absolutely accurate. And that is an important lesson for everybody to learn. There are not two parties in California. There is not one party in California. There are three. There, there's the Republican Party, which is about 25, 26 members of the assembly. There's the Democratic Coastal Party, which is about 25, 26 members of the assembly. Actually, well here, I'm a lawmaker. This should add up to 80 and it's not quite getting there. So maybe, maybe I should say 28, 20. But, but the third party, which is roughly 25, whatever, up to 30, are what are so-called moderate Democrats. And these are Democrats who uh, don't always vote the same way with the, um, the more coastal Democrats. And that's another challenge that I think everybody um, who cares about passing a lot of um, uh, you know, progressive policies will have to consider. And you're gonna have to, I think, fine tune whatever uh, you talk about to appeal to those lawmakers in those districts. I don't think all hope is gone, though. I think that there's a lot of important things that people are working on, and um, I'll just highlight a couple of the ones that I'm working on. Um, you know, I always tell people, I always go out in gatherings like this with voters, and I say, well, what does is, what is our clean energy future look like? And of course, every voter says solar. That's, you know, the, the first thing that they say. And then I say, well, what, anything else? And they say wind. And so I like to turn to rooms like that, and I say, great, that's great. I totally agree with you. But what do we do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind isn't blowing? And most voters get a dumbfounded look on their face. They don't even think about these things. What do you mean? I guess you're right. The sun does go down at night and sometimes the wind doesn't blow. Well, we need more storage of those electrons. That is the biggest barrier that I see to a lot of communities and a lot of homes adopting solar uh, for their rooftop. So I introduced a bill this year. It's Assembly Bill 2868 which is the California Storage Initiative. It's, we purposely named it CSI because a few years ago, or a decade ago, we did the California Solar Initiative. And the California Solar Initiative did a wonderful job with getting the solar deployed in households on a large scale. And we think that if we deploy battery technology, there will be a tremendous future uh, for solar. It's agnostic, by the way, on the, on the battery technology. Um, you know, I mean, obviously lithium batteries are what most people think of, but there's a company that has a cave somewhere in California, and I don't, forgive me for not knowing all the details, but what they do is they have solar panels um, in this very hot part of California, and when the sun is shining, they, they pump air into the cave, and when the sun goes down, they let the air out. And it's a primitive battery, but you know what? It works, it turns a turbine, and it produces a whole lot of power. And that's the same concept that obviously we're trying to do um, you know, at, at every home and with a lot of big, um, big uh, commercial users of power. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk about is, uh, real quick, just is biomethane. Um, a few years ago, I passed legislation that really changed our, the way that California thinks of biomethane. I tried to model California after Germany. They, they use every bit of cow poop in the nation of Germany. They use every bit of landfill gas in the nation of Germany. And I think that if we're gonna have um, you know, self-sustainable cities like Palo Alto, then we need to have that attitude too. There's a lot of people within the environmental movement who say, well, it's still gas and it's still carbon and it's still dirty, but you know, the reality is it's gonna be produced in our society and I think we ought to put it to good use. And so that, that legislation that I authored now allows it to be injected into common carrier pipelines and put to good use. So I see that my time is up and uh, I know that there's probably some questions, so I'm gonna just shut my mouth now. Politician shutting his mouth, it's a rare thing, it happens once in a while. And I look forward to good questions and meeting all of you as the day progresses. Thank you very much. Okay. So, wow. 
one of the things I'm going to ask you and the audience to do is to think about what is the green legacy you're creating for your children and grandchildren. And I think we have an excellent example of four leaders from industry and government here at, at different levels of government, different size cities. Um, and they're really stepping way forward beyond the, the typical. And so um, often in a Q&A, it's um, kind of the audience asking questions of the speakers, but I want you to be thinking about what could you do to double your impact on your green legacy? What are your investments? What is your leadership in your company or your institution that you're part of? How about with your neighbors, with your voting, with your purchasing power? There are many ways that we have that we can make a difference. And I think one of the things that was very consistent among all the speakers was that the, the leadership that the state and the cities and the, our utility have demonstrated not only make a difference for our area, but they set a model for other people so people can learn from each other. And they're not going out and learning from as many people as they can as well. So that's one of the, the great things about this conference is there's a chance to learn from a lot of people, including the really smart people who are sitting on this side of the room. And so I want to, uh, if you have a question or a comment, to be thinking about that. And I, I, before we open up the Q&A to the, to the room, I just wanted to know, are there, do the panelists have any questions of each other that you wanted to ask? Okay, we'll go to the, go to the room. The room um, if you raise your hand and stand up, we'll, Ben will bring you a mic. So who has a, a question or comment? Great, right there. Please say your name first. Uh, Wei Lee. I live around here. I come here all the time. Hi. Um, so I have a question for Jen. Uh, uh, it Jen. I'm sorry, I have to wear my eyeglasses to read, to read my note. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jen, is there any plan that, uh, that PG&E has that, uh, to turn all the energy into 100% renewable? I mean, five years, 10 years, and how? Um, then uh, uh, and, um, another question is for Mike. Mike, uh, what do you think um, a best method to... Okay, well, just one question, because we only have a few minutes left. Okay, the end thank, of you. thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, we offer a green option tariff for customers who'd like 100% renewable. It's a little bit of a premium over the regular rate, but you can sign up on the website or the call center if you're interested in that. Thank you. I think Palo Alto does too. Um, we disbanded it. Oh, you don't um, need it anymore. Because when we went, uh, <laughs> but we're, we're now offering um, a Palo Alto green gas. So great. it's, um, it's a, a bridge method um, for green gas. That's great. We used to have a, a carbon neutral gas tariff, which I think would be interesting to reinvestigate bringing that back. I'm, okay. I'm not sure if... Was that the answer to your question or no? So I think the question is more, you've got a mix at this point. You have what, about 33% renewable in your portfolio at PG&E? I don't, is it 27, 33? Yeah, so I let's say about, about half carbon free and half uh, still natural gas right. in so our portfolio. So what's, what's the, pro, what's the so progression what's, do you think for PG&E going continue? forward? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think there's a demand from the state to continue the path of increasing renewables. It will require more storage in the state. So getting that balance and continuing to operate the system is something we're focused on. Jeff. And the, the question of renewable gas is a great one too, as maybe as gas becomes more renewable or carbon free, uh, then that also starts to replace conventional natural gas. Uh, Jeff Alfs, Peninsula Clean Energy. I guess my question is mainly for Mike. Um, you know, the, the legislature is being more active in a lot of things that are going on, and there's a lot of complicated questions. How granular do you think the legislature will get or want to get in things like storage, uh, you know, wider area firming? We're talking about regionalization uh, over the kind. So, uh, how granular, granular are they going to get, and um, how what effect is that going to have on our ability to kind of be nimble and make decisions going forward? Um, so, so, so I think the legislature does wish to be very involved with these things. Um, you know, like, like any legislative body, I think there's people in the California legislature, just like in Congress, that are more engaged with these things and more, more intellectual about them, and then there's other people who are less so. But I don't think the, the old, the old uh, system of 
the legislature passing a very, very broad bill and sort of, you know, kicking the, de the tough decisions or the, the very specific decisions to some kind of agency, whether it's the Energy Commission, the PUC, the, the California Water Boards, or any of the various agencies, I think those days are over. I think there's a lot of pushback from lawmakers who want a closer... Uh, and, and the reason why is there's this article that was written by Dan Walters. He's a Sacramento columnist. He's about 60, 70 years old. He's seen everything. A very smart guy. And he said that, you know, obviously the, the problem with our system of government is the legislature can give power away, but it can never take it back. And this was really a profound statement because it's really depressing if you think about it. It, it means that the legislative branch has shrunk so much over time. But, but obviously, you know, we, we can pass a policy that says do this executive branch then if they do something else and then we say no 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 you're doing something wrong and then we pass legislation saying to overdo it the governor then just vetoes our legislation because obviously it's his or her appointees who are in that those agencies so that's the problem i think and w once we give that power away it's ne it never comes back and so people want to be more involved with the decisions and i think they will be great right here I, uh, well uh, i'm carl page from the anthropocene institute where and are I appreciate you? Where, your comments. Carl, where are you? Oh, okay, I didn't see you. That was light in my eyes here. Um, it always seems like we only are telling half the story. A lot of people are talking about making energy more expensive, the carbon tax. But we know that renewable energy is already getting cheaper than fossil fuels. Um, we know that there are lots of ways nuclear energy can be cheaper than a penny a kilowatt hour. How about, what thoughts do you have about going to the citizens of the state and saying, we're going to make energy at one cent a kilowatt hour. Not quite sure how. It'll be a combination of renewable and nuclear. We're not, it'll be clean, and um, the economy will improve. Jobs will improve. Tell the upside story, not just the downside of what will happen to you if we don't. And uh, thoughts about that? So I, I'll just say that um, we just entered our latest power purchase agreement, which is a pretty large one for us, um, that is at uh, solar at 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and of course we have a transmission cost that goes with it, so that's not door to door, uh, but that's, that's our commodity price. And that P uh, PPA uh, is to replace our oldest uh, uh, renewable power purchase agreement that it expires in a couple years as a wind, early wind farm, but on top of that, it's expanding our renewable portfolio to accommodate electrification of transfer from natural gas to electricity in, uh, in buildings and the increased demand that we're having toward electric vehicles where we're already at a, a 4% of uh, electric vehicles in Palo Alto are, um, um, excuse me, of vehicles in Palo Alto are electric. I, I like to say we can, we can throw a rock and hit two Teslas now. <laughs> Okay. I, th and I think there is a really good news story that even during the period when renewables were more expensive, because of California's choice to invest in energy efficiency, it still saved money overall on the energy budget, investing in renewables. And now as they've come down the cost curve, it positions the state really well for economic growth with clean energy. So we're going to take time for one more question. Please stand up and bring the mic. Thank you. Catherine Mock, a researcher here on campus. Building from the theme of friendly competition and California as a model, what has been your experience with cooperation or competition across cities in the US, internationally, and also between states and driving up ambition? And in that cooperation, have, how have you seen the relative focus on climate change responses in isolation as compared to the broader emphasis on quality of life that Mayor Burt emphasized? And uh, because we're drawing to the end of our time, I'm gonna let each speaker spend just a couple Minute, have a minute or something answering that question. So, uh, as Mariana said, uh, a couple of us here, uh, Secretary Schultz and I and others, were at the um, Clean Energy Ministerial the last two days in San Francisco, where energy ministers from around the world came to talk about how do you implement COP. And one of the things that happened there was an agreement was signed called the Pacific Coast Collaborative. And that is a uh, agreement between British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California, and six cities in those states to work together in a very meaningful way, very concrete way, to start to put in place the infrastructure, the governance structures, and the incentives that we need 
to accelerate the change. So that's an example of competition, but in a, in a very meaningful way where we've got governors, premiers, mayors, all coming together to work very closely together. Part of that discussion is uh, all about how do you, how do the elected officials get these policies through because no matter how wonky they are, they at the end of the day, they need, as Mike Gatto said, they have to go to a, a group in the room and talk about why gas is more expensive or why the decisions they made are impacting people's lives. So there's a huge emphasis or interest in how we restructure uh, the narrative around this, these actions that we're going to take. So there's so much happening on that collaborative stage. There's so many networks of cities and states that are, that are not waiting for the federal government that want to take action on their own. So I represent about 500,000 people, and I want to build on um, the, the uh, thing that Mr. Burt said when he concluded his remarks, which was those very friendly women in Florida who said, you know, you don't really believe this, this thing, do you? I mean, California, you know, th there are, I think your question talked about, you know, are, are jurisdictions rushing out to compete? And yes, there are some, you know, including those represented up here, who, who they're doing wonderful things, and I think they do have a great deal of civic pride and the leaders there have a great deal of pride with how much they are leading the charge and how they are showing the world what they can do. But then frankly, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of jurisdictions in our state and elsewhere that just don't give a, and, um, and they really, really just don't. And that, that sort of infects the debate because when we were talking about a lot of these really, really key policies last year to the policies that failed that Mr. Weissenmiller talked about, People pointed out that, you know, unless we get more worldwide cooperation, it doesn't mean much. We, California, I think we generate 1% of the world's carbon, unless I'm mistaken. And, you know, we're a big jurisdiction and we're a big state and we like to think of ourselves as just tremendous leaders, but unless we can get the major other sources in the world, China, India, etc., to pay attention to our leadership, there will always be the naysayers that say, that whatever we do here does not mean much. And um, so I guess, you know, there's, there is competition at the micro level, but there are always people pointing out that we need more competition and agreement at the macro level. I got one. Um, so I, I say that I really agree that this is a big opportunity and it's more about collaboration than competition. I mean, we, we do get some, uh, different folks are motivated different ways, but I think that we're seeing a lot of collaboration amongst cities throughout the U.S. and globally. And when, when I was uh, in Paris, it was to attend the summit of local leaders, uh, and uh, that has just grown exponentially in the last five years. But I think we're seeing kind of three different areas of collaboration. One is over uh, technologies and programs. Uh, another is about uh, how to build a political base of support that is broad and not just among true believers. And then finally, what Mike has talked about, which is how to then take that, uh, the combination of, of policies and programs and, and emerging political support and work that into political action uh, in legislation and, um, and, uh, and regulations. And I, I think that all of those have to converge. When we have, just in terms of, of how do you appeal to the non-true believers, um, when we have a lot of, of uh, groups that come through Silicon Valley and Palo Alto, and, and of course everybody wants to know the magic sauce of, of uh, Silicon Valley, and, and uh, an easy answer might be, well, just locate next to Stanford and you're in good shape. <laughs> um, but the other part of the answer that we say is, well, look, we, here's what we are doing in a sustainable community and uh, environmental programs and that our companies and their employees, whether they're specifically in the clean tech sector or not, this, this is a part of the value structure. And this is part of how you can build a, uh, an innovation center uh, and attract these kinds of companies. And so we make that pitch and, um, and I think it resonates. Uh, and so that's another part of the leverage of, of uh, appealing to folks on 
the opportunity for economic success. This is, this is also one of the great growth industries, or probably the greatest growth industry globally in the coming decades. I just wanted to pick up on something Mike mentioned to note that there are so many different kinds of cities with different kinds of interests throughout California that we work with. And you're lucky today that you get to hear from some of the most progressive cities on climate change. Uh, but whatever the city is interested in, there's usually some connection to energy efficiency and renewables. So if they're agriculture and they're located in an area where they have water constraints and air quality problems, renewables and energy efficiency are interesting to them. Or maybe they're in an economically depressed area and they're interested in clean economy jobs. Uh, there's, there's always something that will enable us to work in partnership with the city on energy efficiency and renewables. So I think of my job as not convincing them on climate change, but convincing them on how energy efficiency renewables uh, meet the objectives they already have. Well, I want to thank this wonderful panel and wonderful audience. In fact, I want to make sure we can tweet out from the audience point of view so you guys get to be in the picture too. Let's see if this will work. Yay. Okay. And I want to leave with a, uh, to follow on that comment that uh, Mr. Gatto said about friendship. And if we are true friends to the people we know, we will tell the truth, we will be informed, and we'll encourage them to really stretch their thinking and understanding. In California, we have an election coming up on Tuesday, and there'll, there'll be another one in November. And I think it's really important for us to have leaders at all levels of government who are willing to tell the truth and to take action to protect our future generations. And I want to thank all of you for being here and this great panel. Thank you so much. <laughs>